Hi, beautiful people. Today we are talking to Julie Ferwerda. She is a writer, researcher, and ER nurse. And the primary reason we've brought her on to God is Great today is because she wrote a book called Raising Hell, which really debunks the notion of hell as we know it. And I'm really excited to dive into this conversation because this, I was telling Julie, is the absolute number one most requested topic of all topics. And I know hell and the trauma of leaving it and being threatened by it, especially since a young age, can really permeate the rest of your life. And even underlying some of the decisions that we make, some of the reasons we stay in bad marriages or we turn left or right all come down to some of these notions that we were given of what is going to lead this to this eternal damnation that we cannot escape. So I read this book, Raising Hell, with an open mind, but also on guard as I always do. I still have my belief system that I, that I have, but it's malleable in that if you present information that's logical and biblically sound, I'm listening and I'm being objective about it. And this book really presented some very fascinating truths. Especially with the hell topic, it's sort of the linchpin that... Um, they, that people can use to control anything you do. Like nobody can argue with <laughs> you're going to hell if you, you know, don't do X, Y, or Z, or if you do X, Y, or Z. And it's used as a massive um, abusive tool to control people. And it always has been. Yeah, I think it's so interesting too. I like to continually point out that there's very few just straight up evil people in the world. A lot of people that are regurgitating and giving mm -hmm. out this message are just as afraid and have been just as misinformed as the rest of us. A lot of us have fit ourselves into these boxes that we don't actually inherently fit into, that God didn't make us to fit into. Like if you're an LGBTQ person forcing yourself into a heterosexual marriage, hearing that oh no heaven is for everyone or not you know like salvation is for everyone could be incredibly offensive and hard to swallow after all that time of repressing yourself because when you make sacrifices on that level of sacrificing who god made you to be for the sake of what people are telling you will get you to heaven that's a big pill to swallow if someone tells you hey maybe you didn't have to be doing that maybe you don't have to be living this way to be in well, god's grace that is a really good point because there's a lot of people out there truly giving their lives to their belief system, their um, you know conservative Christian beliefs. And I also just want to make the point here that I don't consider myself an expert on hell, and I'm not a theologian. I haven't been to seminary, but that is exactly why I feel like this message can offer hope and comfort to your average person. I'm a, kind of an average person, even though I was very devout in my faith. Um, anybody can go out and research these things. And I think that's the beauty of it. Like um, if you look through the Bible, you know, God was never looking for the most educated or the most scholarly or, you know, the people who knew the most languages or anything. He was always looking for the simple people of faith. And I feel like that's why I was chosen to write this book because I'm a woman, I'm not seminary trained, I'm an average Joe and I can show people who, that it's not that hard to go out and just figure it out for yourself. And the answers are right in front of you if you're willing to see them. And so throughout my book, I hope you would agree with this. I'm not even trying to say this is how it is. I'm saying, here's evidence and go look for yourself and see that this is true. Yeah, that's what my whole channel is built on to please go look for yourself i'm going to present something to you you have the freedom to figure mm -hmm. out whether or not you discern it as truth but again this is such a huge topic because it does affect so much of our lives and it can be very traumatic when you believe they're being set up for failure all the time um, but the evidence is is really overwhelming like you can't deny it once if you're being honest with it like it's so overwhelming it really is. And I will also say at the top of this conversation that I acknowledge how scary this is. Like, I, I feel like if people were to, if I were to just outwardly say, oh, I don't believe in hell, which I haven't even stated, um, 
I feel like that would be the, the final nail in the coffin for a lot of people to be like, oh, see, I knew she was a Jezebel and a whore, and now she doesn't believe in hell. Like, that, <laughs> that is not a Christian. I spotted a not Christian, and there she is, <laughs> because it's really, you know, a determining factor for a lot of people. But am I correct to believe, unless I got you confused with a different story, is your daughter the one that sort of inspired you to dive into this research? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say she inspired me. I would say looking back, I should have been listening to the child because the child was right. And I have a, my daughter throughout her childhood, she just had a really big heart for God and for people and she could never wrap her head around hell. And she was constantly questioning, you know, mommy, how can this possibly be true that all these people, you know, in these countries that have never heard about Jesus are just going to hell. How is that possible? And, you know, the usual arguments as the good parent, good Christian parent, you know, I was always telling her, we just can't understand these things. You know, God is fair and someday we'll understand it. And um, he's perfectly loving and perfectly just, and he's mysterious. And uh, somehow he will make all these people have a choice even if we're not aware of it, like stupid. Yeah, all the mental loops you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And just over, as soon as I like went down this path and started studying, honestly, it took me two weeks to be sure that hell wasn't true. That's all it took, two weeks. And I spent an, the rest of a full year though, unraveling all the pieces of how it happened, but mm. it falls apart really quickly. And I went to her first and just said, you were right. And she she was like overjoyed. <laughs> wow. And at that time she was in college when I oh, went Oh, wow. Her. Wow. Mm -hmm. After a whole lifetime. That's crazy. And we will get into, you know, what's the point of being good if there's no help. We will get into that. That's on the list. So, oh, actually it's here right now. I'm reading my little script. Um, so what the, I have, let's discuss the common arguments I hear for universal salvation. And when someone believes in universal salvation, it's that everybody is mm -hmm. called and chosen. Mm -hmm. So one of the first questions is like, well, why not live however we want if there's no hell? I actually really love this question. Okay. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, why are you living the way you're living now? Like, what are your motives? If you, if you love God and you, um, you know, you've put your faith in Christ because of your gratitude and your realization that you need to be saved and, you know, all those things. Why are you obeying? Are you obeying because you are still afraid of hell or punishment? Or are you obeying out of love and gratitude? And so really that question shows the motives of the person. I've heard a lot of people say, if I was to give up the notion of hell, like my life would just be on a path to destruction. And I'm, and the thing I would say about that, like the first verse that pops into my head is these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just lip service. If you're following God because you're afraid. And not only that, it, it's not a good motivating factor for anything to do it out of fear. Like yeah. the whole Bible is devoted to do not fear over like over 300 times. It says, do not fear and love covers a multitude of sins and love does not fail. See, so, I've been saying it says over 90 times, which I guess is still technically true, but it's over 300 times that it says not to fear. Well, it depends on the version you're reading, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I'll stick with the over 90 because then I'm still okay. in the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading um, the long version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I agree with you so much. Like, my next question is, if there's universal redemption, then why evangelize? But again, I feel like true evangelism is to encourage people not to fear and to have an earnest evolution within themselves and within their faith. So my notion of evangelizing, let's say I have someone in my life that doesn't believe in Jesus. It's not for me to pound them over the head with the Bible and convince them Jesus exists. I more talk about love and how they exercise love in their lives and how they can exercise the sort of compassion that he did. And then get out in nature, get somewhere that inspires you, close your eyes, see if you sense that divinity. Like I really want it to be from the inside, but I would never say it's because you might go to hell. Although I used to say that when I was younger and to your point, it's not a good motivating factor. Well, first of all, let's talk about the word in the Greek for um, it's the, the evangel or what does that mean? Like, how does that translate into English? Um, Do you know? 
no. evangel it's good news so when you're evangelizing people you're bringing them the good news and um if i remember correctly well there's the verb form to bring to evangelize or bring good news or there's the noun form of the good news throughout used throughout the new testament and not once is it ever used in connection with punishment it's always about bringing good news there's no strings attached like why wouldn't the bible say good news or else and if if that was really true and um you know as far as why evangelize this is a this was kind of a tough question for me to overcome at first because our world is so wrapped up in sending missionaries to save people from hell like that's become the gospel but actually that's not at all the gospel that that's not what the gospel is that jesus or paul or the people of the new testament were preaching the gospel is um is meant to bring you know people out of poverty and and despair and to give them hope and to bring them out of sin consciousness, which I want to talk a little bit about this because I think it's really important. Um, the word sin has been used to, you know, in recent, um, recent days to mean like moral failures, like, you know, having sex outside of marriage or lying or stealing or all those things. But actually the word sin, if you study it in the spirit of the Jewish context, it means to perceive yourself as separate from God and others and all the, the um, actions that result from that. So, um, and also things that you do to yourself out of your perception of separateness and all of these things cause injustice. And if you look throughout the Bible, like the message of righteousness is actually the message, the word righteousness is actually justice and everything from cover to cover, there's this really consistent message of get rid of this sin consciousness that separates you from God and others and come back to that knowledge that you are one with, with other people and with God. And how would your behaviors change if, if I looked at you and I knew that you were the same as me, like you're my neighbor, love my neighbor as I love myself, this fulfills the whole law. And so when you're looking at why evangelize, I mean, think of it this way. If, if um, our sin consciousness is like cancer and 100% of humanity is born with this terminal cancer of feeling separate, which is kind of, you know, we come into this story with this perception of separation and everything tells us that we're separate from the time we're born. What if you knew that there was like 100% cure to this cancer? And um, if you, you know, you went out to share it with people in their lives, their health turned around, their lives turned around. Suddenly they um, had more energy. They felt good. They, you know, everything just changed for them and they became empowered and they were able to start, you know, contributing to this world with their gifts and their love. And anyway, you think of it that way, like sin consciousness is like this cancer and the evangel or the good news is the thing that turns that around and helps people understand they are part of God and they can live in that power and that healing. And that's really the life that Jesus talks about throughout the gospels is this life of being connected to the vine, you know, back connected to the vine. That's so incredible. the good news changes. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And everything you've said is so resonant. And also the whole time you were speaking, just Bible verse after Bible verse kept coming to me about, you know, how we are all stamped with the image of God and, if you really saw that in anything from like the trees that we rampantly cut down to abuse to the pigs that we abuse while farming them to our neighbor that is voting a different way than us, all of this separation. And I talk so much about compartmentalization. For me, it came with sexuality, but I believe it can come with almost any quote sin, which is like mm -hmm. your greed, your desire for power, whatever it may be. As soon as you're focused on this self-focused thing, like you're saying this separate thing that makes you either superior or even inferior, you're suddenly working from a place of compartmentalization. Maybe and not, not competition only God, yes. instead of cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. Am I, I've been defining sin as anything which causes harm. Like to mm -hmm. me, that's been the really easy way to figure out how to navigate. If you can trace anything back to harm of environment, self, other, God, 
anything yeah. you could say you're sinning and and I don't know that really works very well within what you're saying so that's beautiful yeah. Uh, the other thing is too within that evangel evangelizing or the good news is people need to realize that heaven isn't later heaven starts now and that's what the good news is like you know we're supposed to be out feeding the poor and healing the sick and solving you know all these the world hunger and taking care of the earth as stewards and if we were to do that heaven could be now yeah. but even individually once you get that consciousness of your connection to God and the do no harm that you're speaking like your heaven can start now and it's not later. Mm, totally. This feels like a kind of abrupt question, but I, <laughs> whatever, here we go. So this is a really common thing. Again, the, a common argument for universal salvation would be what about Hitler? And I think it's really interesting because in your book, you not only talk about that answer, but you also talk about Martin Luther. And I think the, the idea of those two people and how they've been misconstrued throughout history and then how we, we figure out how to have grace and compassion, even in the most difficult circumstances, is all really shown there. So tell us why Hitler can't go to hell, because we all want him to go to hell. Everybody wants Hitler to go to hell. He's like <laughs> the poster child for the necessity of a place like hell. Right, exactly. Even the interesting thing is that there have been a lot of people besides Hitler throughout history. I guess he's just the most recent maybe or the most relevant. But, um, you know, the first thing I'll start off by saying is that we need to stop for a second and think about what we're saying here because we're saying that this man who um, tortured and killed I don't know how many million Jews. I mean, I'm like six I don't million, I think. Six million. Okay. Uh, we're saying that um, God, who is, you know, supposedly the most loving being of the universe and created all of us, and he's sending billions of people to hell, isn't God worse than Hitler if he's torturing and sending all these people to hell? Like, nobody ever stops to think <laughs> about how this you can just turn this argument on its head because god's way worse than hitler if you think about it especially for the sins quote unquote in which and i let's like actually use sin appropriately so i would say the rules that mm -hmm. you think you're going to hell for it's like the women that had premarital sex are being tortured forever a gay man that married another man is being tortured forever i mean good people like really good people out there <laughs> yeah. just because they didn't jump through the right hoop or know the right formula yeah or they're just born in the wrong region and then they believed in hinduism they're right there. yeah so all right we've we've talked about that but um talk just addressing your question about how it was you know did hitler kind of come to his place of evil, I feel like um, he was influenced by Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, he published a book on Jews and their lives in 1543. And um, so that was like, um, you know, three and a half centuries before Hitler. But he argued that the Jews were no longer the chosen people, but the devil's people. And he, he referred to them with really vile language um, and advocated like setting their synagogues on fire, destroying their Jewish prayer books, forbidding the rabbis from preaching. And he even um, said that, or he gave the permission to do these things and he called them poison, poisonous envenomed worms who would, should be forced into labor or expelled for all time. And um, Luther's words were, we are at fault in not slaying them. And it was kind of a sanction for murder. So you think of going into, you know, through time, people have kind of thought of the Jews as Jesus killers. And they basically um, justified the reasons why they felt like the Jews should be persecuted and killed over this. And so, you know, the, there were a lot of factors there in the times of Hitler. But I think one of the things that we should all be able to walk away with is if we, if you study about how Hitler formed his opinions and everything, which I did a little bit more, you come to the conclusion that if I had walked in Hitler's shoes, I probably would have done the same things Hitler did. You know, he was trying to solve a lot of social and political problems for his people, and he had this worldview that was handed to him. And so, 
the fact is that whether you're Hitler or, you know, Julie Ferwerda living in 2020, we've all got things that we're not proud of, but we've also been handed a history that we don't even understand half of the time that have made us who we are. And nobody can really be judged for a lot of these things, you know, our, um, I, I'm not going to say our innocence, but our naivety and our preconceptions that we come into the story with. So anyway, in my book, I just make a case that we're all Hitler and we're all Mother Teresa. We're both. Like we have the best and the worst in each and every one of us. And the fact is we're trying to wake up to that. Like we're trying to wake up to this in consciousness and why we don't want to cause pain or damage or harm to anyone. And it's through a plan of ages. So there is redemption for Hitler. And um, also um, just throwing someone away is not a good solution to the problem. You know, if you've got a Hitler, would you rather just see him like thrown off into, you know, some compartment in hell forever where nobody ever has any resolve? Or would you like to see Hitler become a really nice person who is really sorry for what he did and he works to make amends with people and to be restored to society? And that's really how the Jews approached offenders is they wanted reconciliation and restoration at all costs. Well, that's the interesting th thing, too, about us as Christians or many other religions drawing hard lines of who is worthy of forgiveness or not based mm -hmm. on our own ideas, mm -hmm. especially when you're not even taking into consideration people's influences, their upbringings, which, again, right. are never an excuse for behavior, right. but they are oftentimes an explanation. And, and in that exactly. explanation is where you can find restoration and healing because those are the roots of the problem and the output of it can be as grandiose as World War II or as can be as small as like cheating on your husband. But either way, you're having an output of something much deeper inside of yourself and you're, you're causing harm from that. So drawing those hard lines, I think, is in part what leads to how broken our justice system is, um, for yeah. example, because we are throwing people away. We're not doing whatever it takes to reconcile them to society. We're not healing the factors that lead people to becoming incarcerated in the first place. And, and that to me would be the most Christ-like output we could have, talking about this restoration and this healing and reforming them back into society. So um, true. Yeah. And we, though, that's why I think a message like that, though hard to swallow, especially if you are Jewish and you have relatives, like I'm Polish, so I have relatives that were murdered in World War II as well. But you do have to come to terms with who we fancy worthy of restoration. Well, I think that this whole concept of hell too has created the notion of throwaways. Like, I wasn't even really aware of how much I categorized people subconsciously when I believed in hell. And it's like, you're meeting all these people in, in your day and you know, that person on a motorcycle with tattoos, oh, he's going to hell. And that woman at the grocery store who's carrying her Bible around, she's going to heaven. <laughs> yeah. just saying subconsciously, like you're categorizing people. But the point, the reason you're categorizing is because you believe in the concept of throwaways. And when you suddenly have a realization that there are no throwaways, it completely changes the way that you approach everyone in your daily world. And you realize that every person is a beloved child of God and not a throwaway. And it would, it would again, going back to that sin consciousness that makes us separate from each other, like it would solve that problem where we it was like the no child left behind only really, you know? Yeah. And, um, where we truly cared about seeing people restored and taken care of as our brother and as, you know, thinking of love my neighbor as I love myself. Yeah. And here I'm going to do a little shout out to my dad. Hello, dad. I'm going to make him listen to this one for sure because I know he'll be fascinated. And, you know, he grew up with a lot of fear in general, just fear of walking to the store, fear of eating fish, fear of hell, fear. And, um, you know, one thing that he said pre this conversation, I was talking to him about how I was going to interview an, an author and a researcher who has mm -hmm. debunked hell. And he's like, not comfortable with that. And, he, and we often talk about how Christians say the Bible is this in, infallible, inerrant word of God. And 
the question becomes, is it true that the scriptures themselves ever claim inerrancy? And my dad already pointed this out, 2 Timothy 3.16, quote, all scripture is inspired by God. And I know you have a response to this, that dad, listen up. <laughs> Hi, dad. <laughs> I feel your pain. I know, um, we've yeah, both actually, been there. Actually, just to say a shout out to your dad, like I grew up with so many fears and here I am in my fifth decade of life and I'm still peeling back the layers of fear that I grew up with and I feel like hell and the the way I was raised in church like made all these layers within me and they're so deep and so you know they affect all the areas of my life and so I feel I do feel like my journey has just been all about unraveling fear and setting myself free from that and getting empowered. But let's just look at this second Timothy three sixteen and 17 and the inerrancy question, because I do get this a lot, but yeah, if you, if you read this, this um, verse, all scripture is inspired by God. Let's just start with, does it say anywhere that all scripture is inerrant or authoritative? It just says inspired. Okay. Right. So God breathed, that's what inspired means. And next question we have to say is, well, what is scripture? At the time this verse was written, um, Second Timothy, the only thing they had were what we would consider the Old Testament writings. They didn't even have the New Testament writings yet. They were working on them in progress. But also when you say which scriptures, most people don't have any idea how the Bible was formed or how we got here. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm just going to share with you some of my findings are that, um, you know, the first thing you have to know is we don't have any original copies of scripture to this day. There's, we have copies of copies of copies with a lot of human intervention in those copies, whether interpretation, language, like at least four language changes, many centuries and millennia even, um, cultural changes. And the other thing is, uh, there's many different versions of the Bibles that we, or the scriptures that we do have, whether you're talking um, the Old Testament Hebrew, there's at least a couple different versions that we rely on, but there's also a Greek Septuagint Old Testament. And we don't even use that today, but the interesting thing is Jesus quoted from the Septuagint from the Septuagint whenever he quoted scriptures. Mm. And um, it reads very differently than the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian Hebrew that, that we mostly use. And then also you have to realize that the Jewish people would say that there were hundreds of holy books and scriptures written before the Roman occupation when all the books, were, like so many of the books were burned. So we don't even have so many of the earliest scriptures. And then um, we also have what's called canon today. And basically this was a few people in the early Roman Catholic Church that decided what was going to be scriptures. You know, we don't have any knowledge or say about this, but there's a lot of books that are still considered scriptural books today that you can find that aren't considered canon. You know, whether it's like the book of Judas, the book of Thomas, the book of Mary Magdalene. I mean, there's so many books. Right. So we have to ask ourselves, what is scripture? And the other thing that I feel like we have to realize, there's a couple of really key verses I, I have come across in the New Testament, like the spirit will teach you all things. And then another one is um, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And what that's saying to me is that it, you can, you know, there's 35,000 Christian denominations for a reason, they're all reading from the same Bibles that we have available today. And even though we, there's, uh, you know, however many um, scriptures out there we don't even know about, even they can't even agree on what we do have. <laughs> yeah. They're all interpreting it differently. And so people hate this idea of uncertainty because I feel like one of the worst things that Western influences brought onto our modern Christian lenses is this idea that we need to have everything nailed down and certain and know exactly why we believe and what we believe and who God is. And, you know, yeah. Um, the, the Jewish people approached it all very differently than this. And we, we need to understand they approached it from a much more agnostic um, worldview where they realized that all of these things we're wrestling with are ineffable. They're not expressible with human words. And they're, they were basically just people trying to articulate 
spiritual truths on paper to the best of their knowledge, knowing that you can't really articulate spiritual truths very well because we're all going to interpret them differently. And even the early Jews would sit around in circles and they would read a verse and every interpretation was welcome as long as it was done from a sincere heart because they knew that the Bible or the scriptures have multiple interpretations at different levels. In fact, the, um, the Jewish perspective on this is that every book, uh, every verse of the Torah had 72 different layers of interpretation. So how do we arrive today and we suddenly think that we want to nail this down and put it into a, a you know, finite statement of beliefs mm -hmm. in, our, in our churches? And so I guess what I want to wrap this up with is, you know, people are saying, well, how can you know what's true then? Like, why should we even read the Bible if we can't like nail it down? We've, we need to start from a different standpoint of we're not trying to, are, the stakes aren't, aren't that we're going to go to heaven or hell here. The stakes are that we are here to have an experience and learn who we are who God is, who we are in relation to God, who we are in relation to others. And we don't have to be certain about all this. We can hold it with a childlike sense of wonder and discovery. And um, we're not here to, to hang our hat on certainties. The, the whole point of the journey of faith was that it was by faith. We didn't know where we were going. And, you know, the, the Israelites, they traveled by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud during the day. And the point of that is they didn't know what was next <laughs> yeah and so if you're not talking about you know these ultimate stakes of going to hell you can hold all this stuff in a in a wonder and just because the spirit of god speaks something to me out of a verse and the spirit of god speaks something to you out of a verse and they aren't the same thing we don't have to be upset over this we can know that we're both in a different place in our journey and that's what we needed to hear for that part of our journey yeah. and we can accept all of the different interpretations, knowing that that's where that person is at on their path. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, really quick, whenever you like do, or you're doing something with your hands and it's doing oh. a little feedback. Sorry. So just be, yeah. No, it's fine. Okay. Just be careful. I'm going to wave my hands so I know what part that comes in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, what was I going to say to that? That's beautiful. Um, da, 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 da. I found so much freedom in realizing the tradition and history of church and of Judaism because coming from evangelicalism as a teenager, I was taught in black and whites and I was also taught that almost questioning your faith in itself was sinful and something to be scared of and what if you're in the midst of questioning a biblical concept and then you die in a car crash. You're going to go to hell. It's just like mm -hmm. so much, so many mental gymnastics when, and in fact, if you read the history, which I deeply encourage everybody to do, it'll give you more freedom and a sense of calm and peace because believing that exploration is okay and just tinkering with ideas in your head and making them become true in your own heart instead of having your whole life be an output of fear and what people were telling you to believe. You can actually own these concepts on your own. Like my faith has only grown stronger. My love for the Bible has only grown stronger in the very scary, what I was told was dangerous moment of not even putting it aside, but wrestling with it. And, and it's ironic because you see so many characters in the Bible wrestle with the gray area of life all the time. There are so few absolutes presented to us. And when even Jesus spoke in parables, to me, that is so telling of the fact that we were always meant to receive messages and glean our messages and, and, and interact with the Holy Spirit in a way that we could actually form our own opinions. Because if Jesus wanted absolute truth and black and white and rules, he could have very easily directly answered people's questions he almost never directly never answered any question <laughs> and I, I've always like I looked at that when I was young thinking oh my gosh how frustrating he must have been to be around like and now as an adult to me it just seems so clear that that was his way of giving us a wink and a nod to say I'm going like I'm making that. this intentionally vague mm -hmm. and not even vague like this is for you this is for you to wrestle with this is for you to discover I'm not going to spoon feed yes. it to you 
Because what's the point of that? What's the authenticity in a, in a relationship build with the Holy Spirit if you have all the answers? You can have that luxury, though, if you know there's no ultimate stakes. But if, you know, if hell seeps into the mix, then suddenly you have to know. You have to be sure. And so it's, yeah. it's changed all of that. But, you know, there's nowhere in the entire Bible that it claims itself to be infallible or authoritative. Yeah, um, this is the perfect sub segue for we're going to go into the weeds here of hell and how it is in the Bible. Um, so my question is, first of all, uh, in your book, you talk about the difference of translation. And I did a little research of my own and I saw that the message Bible, which I hate that Bible. I detest it. I think it's terrible. Mentions hell 56 times. The NIV says it 19. Four translations, including the World English Bible, never mention hell. So what is this discrepancy, and where do any of the scriptures indefinitely for sure mention hell? Well, clearly, if, hell, if I'm claiming hell isn't true, there's nowhere that the, that the scriptures definitely mention hell, and I'll explain that. But you, you forgot to mention the literal versions of the Bible, which they all claim there are zero numbers of hell. Really? Young's literal is one of the most classic one that people are most familiar with. And if you look up hell, you will get zero returns. Um, there's, there's a few different words that, they, that translators have picked and chosen to translate as hell, which already should be a red flag to everybody. I mean, even the fact that you're saying, how come all these versions have different numbers of hell? I mean, that should be huge. If the Bible, is, if people are being true to the, to the translations and, um, you know, the, the people who are translating, every single number, every single Bible should have the exact same number of hells. And right. so what happened is in the Old Testament, um, the only word in the Old Testament that's ever translated as hell is Sheol. And Sheol was basically the unknown place of the dead. You know, it's kind of like the Egyptians, how they were always imagining what death was like, you know, and they would have like their pharaohs and they would bring them food and all those things because they were trying to imagine that's what Sheol was. It was kind of this questionable shadow land that nobody really knew. And they just had a lot of myths and fables and legends around it. Like they knew there's some kind of a holding tank after death, but they don't know what it is. And so the interesting thing is, only um, the King James and the Message are the only Bibles that I know of that, and I'm sure there are other ones, I'm just saying these are the only ones I know of that use the word hell in the Old Testament. And they picked and chose when to translate Sheol as hell when it was associated with the destiny of the wicked. But then whenever it was the destiny of the righteous, they would translate it, or they wouldn't translate it, they would just render Sheol. Wow. So they were so basically it to creating both the righteous and the unrighteous. Yes. But then yes. they translated one for the unrighteous as hell. Right. Right. But it was the same word in the original. Same exact word. And then moving into the New Testament, we will, let's first dis discuss the Gospels. Um, so in the Gospels, Jesus spoke of Gehenna, and a lot of translations made this hell, but actually Gehenna is the Greek version of the Valley of Ben Hinnom from the Old Testament, and it was a literal valley right outside of Jerusalem. And, you know, the point to make here is that Jesus only spoke about Gehenna on four unique occasions, and that was when he was speaking to the apostles and the Pharisees. So when he was speaking to the masses and the crowds, he never warned them about Gehenna. So you can't say Jesus was warning anybody about hell. He was trying to speak to the people out of their own traditions, you know, the teachers and the apostles. And Gehenna was a, a valley outside of Jerusalem that was known as a place of national judgment for Israel because uh, it was a place where they kept, supposedly kept garbage and a lot of the rejects of society lived homeless there or something. I mean, you know, none of us really know. We're just going off of some of the legends or maybe earlier writings, but um, the point there is that the Israelites used to burn their children in fire to Moloch in this valley, and God said in Jeremiah that that was like the most detestable and horrible thing that never entered his mind that they should do that, and he set up Gehenna as, you know, a place of remembrance or judgment for them, and so to think that God himself was criticizing the Jews for burning their children 
<laughs> in fire. And he would go ahead and do, he's like, oh, good idea, you guys. Yeah, I'm still coming thanks. up with that. that. Was a great suggestion. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's really trippy um, to realize so, that God was condemning the burning of somebody. And then we translated it somehow, turned it upside down. Right. Decided that's what God does. So then anyway, Jesus, when he was speaking to them, he was talking about a national place of judgment that was a literal valley. You can still go there and have a picnic to this day in the valley of ben Hinnom or Gehenna. So um, then in the rest of the New Testament, though, there's a couple of words translated as hell. One is Hades, and Hades is the Greek counterpart to Sheol. It's that place of the dead. So it's just basically swap out Sheol and Hades as Greek or Hebrew, from what I understand. Hades has some really negative connotations to me. I feel like the, even the words sound scary. And it's probably, I guess, from cinema and literature that I just have all the depictions of flames when I think of Hades. Well, and some of the ancient philosophers made, you know, they philosophized about Hades too. And that's where a lot of the fear came in, you know, probably even like Dante's Inferno and Plato and, you know. Now, hold on, let's get into that because I want to dive into Dante's Inferno for sure. But um, the last word real quick is, that was translated as hell in the New Testament is Tartarou. And I don't think, I mean, I've tried to research what Tartarou is. It's actually a verb that means to cast down and it's used in like Second Peter. I have notes somewhere, but it was, it was um, a really strange verse in the Bible about angels being cast down into pits. And nobody knows what that means, but it was a verb. It wasn't even a noun, like, you know, hell's a noun, so. Hmm. And it's, so it's only used once. Once, right. Okay. And then I think it's also worth pointing out that Jewish people don't believe in eternal damnation or hell, which is something I had only learned about maybe one and a half years ago or something. And that was so eye-opening because I'm like, how can people of a faith tradition that use half of the text that I worship, I don't worship the text, but you know, that mm -hmm. I use, um, how could they not believe that? Especially since the Old Testament has the, uh, what word am I looking for? Like the stereotype of being the much scarier part of the Bible yeah. or the less the vindictive uh, gracious. God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Jews, I, I think they had a lot of different sects of beliefs and supposedly the fairy pharisees did subscribe to a type of hell i don't think it was eternal but they got that from zoroastrianism they believe and you know the pharisees were the ones that were mostly criticized anyway by, right. by jesus and then um i think that there was maybe a belief in a time of of punishment but it wasn't like utter you know just being mean to be mean punishment it was more of a reflective or being taken away from the presence of God or something for a time of reflection, but it was never about any kind of eternal punishment. Hmm. But there were different- Which sounds like just like the separation we were talking about at the top of mm -hmm. the conversation, which I've heard a lot of Christians say like, you know, they'll concede, okay, maybe hell is not literal torment. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not actual fire. Maybe right. it is just God turning his head away from you forever. And you were without that presence forever. But I think the thing we want to point out is that in biblical research, you'll find that there is no, there is no definitive forever mentioned mm -hmm. anywhere in the Bible. No, that's another thing. If you look in Young's literal translation or any other literal Bibles, you will never find the word forever because the Jews didn't speak about forever they were only concerned about the here and now and when we say the word, forever, we're not talking about eternal either eternal is right not. no eternal no forever they used a word in the hebrew olam which meant beyond the horizon like that we can't see and they weren't concerned with the afterlife they were concerned with the here and now and how we treat our neighbor makes me so mad we don't have a more accurate Bible. I want to read the real Bible. Every time I learn these things, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, speaking of difficulties, St. Augustine, I feel like the more, I, I feel like he's such an elevated figure and I've read a lot of quotes from him that are cool and then I'll learn more about him and I'm really coming to a point of strong dislike for this guy. Yeah. Much like Martin Luther, like I know that he is elevated on a pedestal and I've read beautiful things from mm -hmm. him, but then you hear 
these right. terrible things he said. It's almost hard. It makes sense because no human being is infallible. No human being is always good. So of course these potentially mm-hmm. great men would be fallible, but the fallible things they did seem pretty egregious. Um, mm-hmm. And St. Augustine was the one that you're saying was in part responsible responsible for making Dante's Inferno, which is just a piece of literature that's not religious, that had nothing to do with the Bible. He was the one responsible for making that our vision of eternal hell in a biblical way. How did that happen? Well, I think the biggest problem that we had in our church history from the West is that we were from the West and we were relying on Latin and Roman influence. Um, if you look at the churches and the, the earliest theology schools, I believe there were six of them. Four of them taught etern- uh, universal salvation or universal reconciliation, which is what I espouse. So four out of the six, and those were the Eastern schools that basically came out of Jesus and the apostles. And then Um, one of the six taught eternal damnation in Carthage, and that was the Latin school, the one of the Western, the start of the Western faith. So like we were handed this religion that completely diverged from the earliest apostles and teachers. And I think even to this day, the Eastern Orthodox Church still espouses universalism, at least, um, you know, there's a lot of branches, but I know at least one of the main branches does. Um, Augustine is considered the champion of the doctrine of hell. Uh, And he lived in, I believe, until, I think he died in like 430 CE, but he, the doctrine of hell didn't even become orthodox in the church until, until Augustine. So the fifth council in the fifth century was when hell became the orthodox position in the church. And I think that's really important because when you grow up in the, the, um, evangelical Christian church or the conservative Christian church in America today, you're kind of taught that there was this long time consensus back to Jesus and the apostles that hell just is a thing. And yeah. this is how it is. And nobody tells you that it wasn't even the Orthodox position until the fifth century after Christ. And it was only in the West. But wow. um, Tertullian, I believe he was the inventor of the concept of hell, but um Augustine by far was the champion. And I just want to give you a quote out by Dr. Ken Vincent. He's the author of over 100 books in the field of psychology and religion, and he tackles all these topics. And he says, by far the main person responsible for making hell eternal in the Western church was St. Augustine. He was made Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. He didn't know Greek. He had tried to study it, but stated that he hated it. Sadly, in his misunderstanding of Greek, he cemented the concept of eternal hell in the Western church. Augustine not only said that hell was eternal for the wicked, but also for anyone who wasn't a Christian. So complete was his concept of God's exclusion of non-Christians that he considered unbaptized babies as damned. When these babies died, Augustine softened slightly to declare that they would be sent to the upper level of hell. And he's also the um, inventor of the concept of hell light, also known as purgatory, which he developed to accommodate some of the universalist verses in the Bible. So um, (laughs) that's kind of his. So he created his own doctrine and then he allowed the Bible to inform some of the concessions he made to sound less harsh. Well, Sadly, too, because of Augustine, that's when you like get the um, impetus or the the um, start of the ideas that led to the Inquisition and the Crusades and all those terrible, violent torture chambers of you know the the Middle Ages. They all came out of what Augustine did. I mean, this is, I truly keep coming back to this idea that the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is fear because I can trace every bad thing I've ever done back to a place of fear, whether it was insecurity or greed or loneliness or, you know, Mm -hmm. these, these deep, dark things you have all are bred from that one place. So it doesn't surprise me that a completely fear-based, terrifying Mm -hmm. doctrines output was human torture and devastation and death and murder in the Inquisition and and Mm -hmm. all of that strong-arming too that is not whatsoever reflective of Jesus's message. 
And I think a lot of us, like I myself, would always kind of brush off the Spanish Inquisition when I was like more evangelical mm -hmm. and just be like, well, one small section of people were at fault for that. And that had nothing to do with Jesus. And who even knows how they came up with that. But if you realize that the, the trickle down effect of that is still us believing that we're going to go to eternal, eternal damnation for masturbating or that our incredible Buddhist neighbor is going to an eternal mm -hmm. damnation just for being different than us. Right. I'm sure like your daughter said, it brings you so much anxiety. And then your evangelicalism is not true to the word. It becomes all fear-based. I have to save this person so they don't go to hell. I have to stop masturbating so I don't go to hell. Which bleeds into the very us versus them and the very competitive view on the world where, you know, it's this, eat or be eaten idea yeah. and we don't realize it like you have all these weird um what's the word not dichotomies but you know like contradictions in your head where you just on one side you know you're here to love and not judge but on the other side you have to judge unless these people can contaminate you and your family and send you to hell right. like <laughs> just... uh, the, the verse I get more often than anything else um, as like the rebuttal to progressive Christianity is Jesus came, you know, with grace and love, but he also brought a sword. Everybody keeps saying he also brought a sword. And I think a lot of times the interpretation is, no, we can't believe these rules are not rules because Jesus does want us to not go to hell. And that's important. Like, I'm pretty sure it all just goes back down to hell all over again. Yep. Uh, so, okay. I think your next great, great question that the book poses is how can God truly win if so many of his children go to hell? I would be hard pressed to find a Christian who would say, God and Jesus are not victorious in the end because of Jesus's death and because of that sacrifice that that there wasn't an ultimate victory. We also have access to all the verses that say every knee shall bow, every tear shall be wiped from our eyes. And that says every, which implies everyone. So when you consider all of that, you know, I can't imagine asking Christian like how could God have won? How could Jesus' victory have been real if my beautiful neighbor or my mom who never like believed in Jesus because she was a little more hippy dippy is going to eternal damnation? How am I supposed to enjoy heaven even if that's true? And above all, how could God truly be victorious if much of his creation is tortured and, and burned forever? Well, you know, it's kind of like I was saying earlier that all these lies are packaged in truth. And the way it's presented is that God is victorious over sin and evil, not that God is victorious. And mm -hmm. so it's a little twist there. But really, if you think about it, if I were God and I was planning to create a world where I knew that most of the people that I created or whoever lived were going to be damned and only a few would be blissfully rewarded or saved, I wouldn't even create the world I would just scrap that plan and <laughs> right. write a better story you know but which is why it doesn't make any sense to think that God doesn't plan to get what God wants and so um, the way we have orchestrated the story now in our minds is that God loses and Satan wins because we're saying you know God loses most of the people and and the earth and everything is just burned up and uh, not worth saving but a few verses, like you said, that come to mind for me, you know, Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And then God said, there's like three places in the Bible where the um, all in Adam are beautifully constructed next to the all in Christ so that you know that it's the same all. It says, um, as in Adam, all died. So in Christ, all will be made alive, but each in his own order. And I think this was the first verse out of 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23 that I saw that opened my eyes mm. because I was like, what else, how could I, I've read this verse a million times, but how come I never saw it this way? It's the same all in Adam that died that are being all made alive in Christ. And, um, you know, another verse that I, I want to focus on here because I want to talk a little bit about the Greek is in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
And right here, God is declaring his victory over his creation because the word that is used for will there is bulima, and bulima in the Greek is something that cannot be changed or thwarted or blocked or stopped. It is God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And, you know, repentance is, is a beautiful word too. It really, it's the word metanoia, and it means above reasoning. And this is like the change of consciousness that comes upon us from the inside. It's not it's not like groveling for your sins. It's like a change, a shift that happens in you when you realize what God has done for you. So, um, you know, and then lastly, just that verse that says death is swallowed up for all time. How can million, billions of people be in a state of eternal death if there is no more death? It says there is no more death. So there's nothing about, like once you put on these new lenses and you start reading the Bible, you start realizing God uh, God declares what he wants. He gets what he wants and what he wants is for all to be saved. And it's going to happen. When you, when you quoted that verse, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. That's not on their way to hell. That's saying that in their season, every person is going to have this change of heart where they realize that, uh, you know, they get rid of this sin consciousness and they realize they are part of God and they are part of all others. It's just the, the point being in their season. I think this really is a place where you might have to contend with your own humanity. Like anyone that's listening that I'm sure this conversation would bring up a lot of fears for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I would just ask everybody to, to take a step back and trace where the messages you received were output from, were they output from your church leader from what you've seen on television or movies, like really try to trace back your beliefs about hell and where they came from. Because if research shows that St. Augustine took a fictional novel and made it biblical, you know, you really do have to question that and maybe allow yourself to understand that, okay, wait, <laughs> I don't have to conflate these two images anymore jesus and this like hellfire because it was based in a fictional book and and just allow your staff to start like releasing some of these things like you said like you may realize okay i intuitively don't feel or believe that hell exists but it doesn't mean you won't have a long journey of unraveling all of those ways that you got twisted and tripped up another thing about humanity that i think people would have to confront here is what we were talking about off the top, why have I made all these sacrifices if everybody gets to go there anyway? Like, why does my friend get to sleep with her boyfriend and I can't, but I, I don't have the reward of heaven because we all have it, you know? Like, you're gonna have to confront, well, why do you feel that way? And, and why do you feel that an injustice has been done to you for the fact that your friend also gets to enjoy the same thing that you do? Is that a selfish is in, it, is in you? Is that a fear in you? Because that's where your humanity will lie. And I think it's also worth noting, again, going back to the criminal justice system, which I've been learning more about. I've read so many interviews from, let's say, mothers and fathers of murder victims who go to the electric chair or to the injection place and, and get to see that killer brought to justice, hum, human justice, what we believe to be justice, and feeling just as empty and if not emptier. And I'm not saying across the board, maybe some people did feel victorious in that, but I think it's interesting that even in human nature, a lot of us intuit that justice is not served in evening a wrong. Justice is more well served, like you said, with repentance. And a lot of us think people are crazy. Like I remember a black woman had immediately pronounced that she'd forgiven uh, her son's white killer. And it became a racial story. I wish I remembered her name, but I don't. But I remember thinking, I'm sorry that this has become simply a racial conversation and, and it's been politicized when in fact, I think this woman was really just trying to release herself. And also she was granting the invitation, like maybe she just simply knew that true repentance would be where she would feel justice for her son's death. Like seeing that man actually say sorry would bring her more peace than seeing him die 
on the injection table. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I guess, first of all, I just want to say if people are afraid that they have more to lose, then, you know, they're afraid of what they have to lose of, you know, I did all the things right. And now my neighbor who's just living however she wants, you know, is also included in, in the heaven docket. Um, I guess what you really need to take away here is that you stand so much more to gain by recognizing and realizing that it's a safe universe and that God doesn't have limits on his or her love for you. And the closest thing I can say for myself when I had this realization is for the first time in my life, even after being saved technically for decades is that I felt born again for the first time Mm. because Suddenly I realized that there really was nothing I could do to, you know, like threaten my relationship with God. There was nothing that I had to worry about as a mother. Like that was so important. Um, I oh, think- wow. The stress of a mother, like watching your child not mm-hmm. believe in Jesus, the, the stress of that, because then it's not just that they don't believe the same thing as you. It's like, oh my God, what if they go to hell? Well, you feel like you have to control everything and everyone around you if, if there's any chance that you might lose them to some eternal separation from you and right. you know, suffering. And so the mental liberty that you get of realizing that God is ultimately victorious and that all people are saved and, uh, you know, that everybody's got a level playing field now, suddenly you have so much more to gain. And I guess just I don't really have a lot to add on your, on your question about, you know, the repentance, the question that, you know, that you were asking about the, you know, the person trying to forgive their, um, the victims, families, you know, trying to forgive the person that had, had uh, killed the daughter or whatever, because I just do think, like we said, the, the, Lex talionis, which is the law in the Old Testament that eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth that we've, um, we are, are all familiar with. What that was isn't saying that everyone should be, the punishment should fit the crime. What it was meant to do in the Jewish law was to limit the severity of the crime so that people wouldn't over punish. And, you know, Jesus even took that one step further. He said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He was referring back to the law. But I say, you know, if your enemy strikes your left cheek, give them your right cheek. And if they, you know, want to, if they take your shirt, give them your coat too. And if they want you to walk a mile with them, walk two miles. You know, Jesus was turning that on its head saying, the spirit of the law here is we don't, not only do we not want to overpunish, but we want to show kindness. And that's how we change the world is by, and heap the coals on our enemy's head is by showing them love and love never fails. So, you know, the lady who wanted to forgive the killer, that's what it does. It relieves you of the burden and it also relieves them of a burden and then the healing can begin. Exactly. Yeah, I thought that was really eye-opening, God's heart for, quote, punishment. And and the eye for an eye does definitely sound like you need to get yours. And I think that it's just so clarifying to realize that was to (laughs) mitigate the harm that, you know, people aren't being overpunished for things that they were doing. And then also, like you're talking about Jesus, I think a lot of people interpret that as him being a pushover. And then that's when they go to the verse of like, he also brought a sword or he also overturned tables in the temple. Like he still had a spirit of justice about him. But I do, I like agree with what you're saying that that's not, that's not really about justice, even though the Bible says like justice is the Lord's that moment is about can you not only forgive, but can you extend grace and kindness? Can you free yourself from the shackles of unforgiveness by truly forgiving and giving of yourself when that is really, really difficult. I will say too, I don't, I don't believe that um, forgiving someone is saying that they didn't, they don't need to be responsible for what they've done. Like I do believe that in this plan of ages that Jesus talks about, which is a whole nother new concept that people have to start wrapping their heads around. This isn't the only 
this lifetime and the Bible doesn't say anywhere that this is the only lifetime that we have to get, get it right and to grow and to, you know, become conscientious, loving humans. So at some point in this plan of ages that we're living through, those people will be sorry for what they did and they will, you know, become the kind of person that people can envision as redeemed and reconciled and that's where all the healing comes in. It's not from seeing them suffer. You know, the healing comes in from seeing them changed and want to make amends. Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I won't name names here, but I've witnessed um, a woman in my life who her husband cheated on her while she was pregnant, left her high and dry, you know, did all of these terrible things to her. Mm -hmm. And she, for a lifetime, as far as I can see, has held on to that unforgiveness and just wanted the worst for him all the time. And in the meantime, I witnessed his life and, you know, what we're talking about of the freedom that you're saying you have when you just allow that you cannot leave God's grace, you cannot be forever not forgiven or, or forever separate from him. And, and that gives us freedom as people that do want the best. I think the flip side of that coin is a lot of people get scared and be like, oh, well, then people want the worst. Won't they just go off and do their own thing? But a part of this story is like, I, I rarely see people actually genuinely get away with what they were doing. Even if they don't go to prison for it and they, they should have, even if they seem to be elevated in ranking, even though they didn't deserve it or they've done egregious things where they're not good representatives. Um, there is an inner turmoil that still exists. There yeah. is, there is a justice that I see in this world and I do believe that there is hell and heaven present on earth mm -hmm. because we can just see it reflected in the worst of humanity and the best. But I do think of it if we believe that justice is the Lord's, I think that's more, I've interpreted that as God giving us the freedom. Like you are allowed to let go. You're allowed to forgive. And by the way, if something horrible has happened to you, I'm not rushing you on that. I'm not judging you for being Amen. capable of forgiving for a period of time. Like, oh my God, of course. And I know that there's so much grace for that as well. But, you know, everyone says that unforgiveness is the poison that you drink yourself. And yeah. I feel like justice, God saying justice is mine, is to give you that freedom to be like, don't worry, you can let this go. You can forgive it. I will handle it. And I don't know if we can always see him handling it, but I believe that he does. I, I agree with that. And I I feel like I've had a lot of injustice done to me through certain relationships and situations, and I've had a lot of loss. And I will just say that I agree with you that you can't rush anyone in this process. And there is a natural um, cycle of grief that you have to go through when you're processing wrongs done to you, even the, the wrongs of religion. Like when you wake up to hell, it's a whole nother stage of grief that you have to go through, you know, and the stages are shock, anger, depression, acceptance, like those are the four stages of grief. And nobody can say how long you have to go through those, but they're really, it really is true. Like your friend who, who can't let go of the bitterness that she has for the guy, what's her life like? Like, is she a happy person? You know, is she bringing unhappiness on herself because she can't let go of that? And I think that's what you, eventually you come to grips with the fact that as long as you can't let something go, you're the one in prison. And you have to trust that the universe is good and that, and that God loves you and God wants you to have full healing and full reconciliation of this. But if you know that you have more than just this lifetime to get to make that happen, you don't have to put a time restraint on it. You can live this life free knowing it's going to be taken care of and trust that God is just and God will make sure that you are fully... Um, recompensed is the best word I can think of for this wrong that was done to you and just trust God to do it in God's time. But in the meantime, let go. Yeah, I love you wrote, I have come to realize that nobody ever had a change of heart through external coercion or punishment. I believe true judgment is corrected, convicting us with life changing realizations about how we've treated others. This is what drives prodigals home. I believe that fully. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to believe it in a world where there is so much injustice and people are often not 
in our opinions, righteously punished for the things that they've done wrong. But if you think about it, like, you know, a lot of people are still holding on to that there's this great judgment that we go through and all their enemies are punished in the judgment and they become sorry somehow. But if you think about like your life, were you ever sorry, like truly made to be sorry by outward punishment? I mean, that's not how it works. How it works is you have this shift inside of your heart where you realize what you did to hurt somebody and you are so full of remorse and sorrow and wanting to make it, it right. And I feel like that's how it's going to happen for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the distinction there is shame. I think through mm -hmm. coercion and punishment, I've felt shame, which is mm -hmm. just external, but you're right. It doesn't, it doesn't change the inside. It doesn't want to make you course correct. To me, conviction is when you have that course mm -hmm. correction and that's when it's authentic repentance. Right. I mean, this has been so beautiful. And again, like, I hope you're up for revisiting if people have any questions. I feel like this was a really comprehensive beginning to the conversation. I am going to promote you to my other friends that have podcasts and such because I think this message is so important. And I know it's going to be controversial. I can already see the comments beneath this video. But do you have any final thoughts on perhaps how people can process this or invite this exploration without fear? So, you know, I grew up being taught that the truth can defend itself and there is no fear in love, you know, perfect love casts out all fear and all those things. And when I started going down this path of questioning, I had to really put that to the test. And I had even raised my kids, you know, you can question anything like God wants you to be a good thinker. He created you to have a beautiful mind and he wants you to ask questions. And why would you ever be punished for being honest with your questions? If anything, you're not being real or, or authentic if you can't ask honest questions and expect an answer. And so I would just say if there's something in you that is really questioning, like how could hell be fair? And you're looking at all the ways that it's uh, brought about bad fruit in your life of desperation and, you know, acts that you're not proud of because like Brenda said, you're just living in this fear that drives you to do things that you wouldn't normally do like pause and just know that God is big enough for your questions and then be honest enough with yourself to let the evidence follow where it leads. Like, don't be afraid of the evidence and don't rely on what anybody else tells you because this is really important. This, this changes the entire worldview and foundation of your life and it can reap incredible benefits to get to the bottom of this. So um, just don't be afraid to question. So, you know, make sure that you make it a priority to look into it yourself. If you want to read, you know, the books that I've written here, I show you how to study these things for yourself, not just to take my word for it, but the, I always say the evidence is so overwhelming. The third grader could see it. It's, there's just no evidence for hell and it can, despite all of your fears and everything, it's worth it to face them and to, you know, just ask God at the beginning, don't let me get off the path here. Like keep me safe and show me your truth and show me what your character is. And I believe God will be absolutely faithful to that calling, you know, it's the intent that you go into it with. So ask for help and then don't be afraid and be willing to face whatever you find. Yeah. And that's tough. I think the last thing I'll say on that is, it's just so funny because I've heard that exact sentiment from so many evangelicals and so many legalistic believers. They'll say, well, just read the Bible and dive in and do your studying and don't be afraid of what you find. But then there's always the caveat of, and then you better end up here where I told you you have to end up. And so. then run it by your pastor just to make sure you heard correctly. <laughs> exactly. And that takes away the truth of surrender, which is something that God asks us for so often. And I know it is so scary to surrender to true faith, but the true faith is to me the belief that God will not let you go, that he won't let you go too far. Uh, the perfect example of it that was so subtle is I was talking to Pete Enns, the theologian, and I was talking to him 
you know, he was like, don't be afraid to explore. You're like one of those dogs on the bouncy leash where as soon as you get a little too far, you feel that tug like that to him was how he described the Holy Spirit and that conviction. And for me, that came where one time I flippantly said I hated Paul because so many of his <laughs> verses have been used to clobber us and to hurt right. women. And, mm -hmm. um, and when it came out of my mouth, I felt sick to my stomach. I felt that yank that was like, oh no. And it was beautiful because I loved that it was for such a subtle thing. It wasn't about my sexuality or these huge topics of life. It was about this very subtle thing, how I felt about this one biblical character. So have that faith that you'll hear that message even in the smallest, most discreet way. You'll know when you're going off track. And if you trust that, and like Julie said here, really lean into prayer and, and at the top of your game, be like, I'm going to dive into this crazy book. That's kind of scary, but you tell me God when it's right and wrong and try to resist calling the person that clobbers you all the time, because you already know what they'll say. So right. look, look for yourself and you can come to this different conclusion, write us and be like, yep, I researched it and hell is real. Great. You, you did your due diligence and you right. came up with something different. Like I respect that, but just go for it, do it. Well, thank you so much, Julie. This has been such a pleasure. Again, the book is Raising Hell. There's two different versions. One is condensed, which I loved, even though I'd love to dive into the, the deeper, more There's comprehensive the one. one. There's the yeah. small one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Same one. Same uh, cover. Great. And that's it. I will link uh, resources below. And we love you all so much. God bless. Thank you, Julie. That was very incredible. I really appreciate it.